So now today, uh, let's turn to Susan. Uh, Susan's a, a very good friend to, to a lot of us. Um, you know, she was a mainstay in the world of War of 1812 reenacting, but also a number of other time periods. And then a, a special type of reenacting Susan did was, um, you know, the, the, the Canadian Army Medical Corps as they were depicted in World War I. So Susan's going to share with us a, a lot of her research around one of her passion topics. And without any further ado, I'm going to get out of the way and then turn this over to Susan. So. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tom, and for and to Chris as well. And thanks to you for putting together these this uh, lecture series. It's been really interesting to watch everybody and and uh, listen to everything everyone has to say. Um, as Tom mentioned today, we're talking about the medical corps. It's a huge subject. It's a deep subject. So my job today is just just scratch the surface and pique your interest and see what's coming up. See if I can talk you into looking into it further on your own. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. First, a little background. Founded in 1980 or 1885, rather, they were um, out first in support of the Northwest Campaign. Uh, the Medical Corps also saw action and distinguished itself in the Boer War. Uh, it's, it's divided into two different sections. There's the regular section or permanent section and then a militia section. And the militia did field training for two weeks every summer at, at Base Borden or Camp Niagara in Ontario. And they also hold, held regular lectures, drills and training throughout the winter across the country. So all in all, they're, they've got a good structure. They're in a good headspace should a war happen to break out. They have an idea what needs to be done. They have a plan and they've got some trained people. And lo and behold, on August 4th, 1914, war does indeed break out. Next slide, please. So what do we bring into the table? We have 20 officers who are all doctors, five nursing sisters and 102 other ranks. So those are people who are orderlies and so forth. That's the main part of the army. In your militia, you got another 57 nursing sisters, six cavalry field ambulances. And when we're talking about ambulances, we're talking about a group of people, not a vehicle. Um, you've got 15 field ambulances and two clearing hospitals. Those are just hospitals at army bases. So not quite enough to take an entire country to war. Next slide, please. So they get to work. And just under a month later, there are now up to 30 regimental officers. These are doctors who will be embedded with each regiment that is going over. They've got three field ambulances because they've taken all the little regional ones and put them together. Uh, men made three full-size ones. You've got a casualty clearing station, two stationary hospitals and two general ones. And the difference between a stationary and a general is really size. Stationary are about 200 people, Gen generals are anything bigger than that, at least at the beginning of the war. One sanitary section and one advanced depot of medical stores. And those are exactly what they sound like. And all of these are gathered in Valcartier, Quebec. Next slide, please. Embarkation starts September 22nd. It took 11 days. The Medical Corps and 30,000 or so other people were loaded onto 32 ships. And right about now is when the wheels start to come off. All of the units are split up. The Medical Corps is on seven different ships and they've been able to gather up enough medical equipment because there was nothing really specialized at the time and you could buy it. But they and all the other 30,000 people are short on Knives, forks, dishes, pillowcases, ticks, beds, you know, things you might want to put together a hospital. And what's happened is the timeline is so short that some of these things have been ordered in bulk, like you can order a zillion sheets in bulk. They're rushed into the, at the last minute and they're loaded in to, to the ships on mass packing cases so that nobody's stuff is sorted out. You can see where this is going, can't you? Then all the other supplies were mixed in. The items were not on the same ships as the units that were going to be using them. Uh, they were loaded as they arrived, where things fit, people's personal effects got mixed in, and it is just the giant mess. Not a good start. Another thing that happens as they're trying to get on board, the, uh, the nurses are loading, there's 101 of them, and um, all of a sudden, four or five civilian ladies show up at the docks and they're waving telegrams and saying, I'm a nurse and I'm coming on board. Now the matron in chief is looking at these women and going, I have never seen you before, who are you? Um, and it turns out that they have no qualifications. They're just daughters or nieces or friends of important people. 
typically members of parliament, members of provincial parliaments, very wealthy people. And they've got a note that says, so-and-so who's in parliament says that I'm going to World War I as a nurse. Well, that went over well, as you can imagine. Um, and the matron in chief was able to kick all four or five of these guys off, but they would be back. Um, we're gonna see them again. Anyway, so calm reigns, everybody's on board. It's all mixed up, but they still depart on October 3rd. And they arrive without incident 11 days later. The nurses are greeted by none other than Lady Astor with an invitation to tea, thank you very much. And they're invited to board as guests of St. Thomas's Hospital in London, which is a real thrill because this is the hospital that uh, Florence Nightingale has founded. The men, well, they're not quite so lucky. Next slide, please. They end up, and the other 30,000 of them end up on Salisbury Plain, which is a lovely place to visit in summer, but they walked right into the wettest winter in 60 years. In the first 75 days there, it rained for 70 of them, and the place is just a wash. Even the cathedral is a wash. It's miserable and tense, so they start to build huts to house the men. The huts aren't well ventilated. The men start to get sick. It's too wet to train in any kind of a serious way. The men are bored, they're being paid well. A lot of them, it's the first time away from home, they wander into town. And before you know it, they bring back to camp 1,269 cases of venereal disease. Perfect. So all these sick men have to be dealt with, the venereal guys and the people who are regularly sick. The original plan is for the British hospitals to do it, but they're suddenly overrun with a, a wounded coming in from the first battle at Ypres. So number two, Canadian general is asked to, to handle the Canadian patients, but they have to confess that they actually haven't found their supplies yet. Um, they end up borrowing a bunch of field ambulance supplies and they make it work, but you know, it, things are not going well. Um, speaking of supplies, they start gradually trickling in by train uh, to any one of several stations around Salisbury Plain. And the idea was that you would go out to the station, you would pick out your stuff, and then you would come back. And of course, that worked not at all, because some people overtook, some people undertook. You know how that works. Um, and then they're unpacking the supplies, and they look, are looking at this stuff, and they're looking at some of the vehicles and things that have been sent for the first time. And it's discovered just how badly the wheels really are off. And it can all be laid at the feet of one man. Next slide. Canadian Minister of Militia and Defense, Sam Hughes, Colonel the Honorable Sam Hughes. And now if you're a student of Canadian World War I history, you will probably have just said to yourself, oh no. And you'd be right. But we have to look with the eyes of the time. And right now to the Canadian public, Sam Hughes is a hero. He has raised 30,000 plus troops and set up a whole camp where it was just fields before in a matter of weeks. But he did it by overruling the procedures that the armory already had in place to make sure that they could manage the influx of new recruits. He just dismissed them as pedantic. Sam has got a real damn the torpedoes attitude and he's a passionate Canadian, but he is not a good organizer. And when things go wrong, he never accepts the blame. Next slide, please. So here's what's happened. To counteract the shortage of, shortages of well, you know, everything, government contractors are sent out across Canada to fill the need. And it's a good idea because every city and town should have the, benefit, the opportunity to benefit from supplying to the military. It's a financial boost, it's a moral boost, gets everybody on board. It would have been a far better idea if they'd been sent out with old patterns, specifications, approved designs, quality control might have been a thought, financial control maybe. None of that happened. Um, timeline is so tight that they are, things are rushed in at the last minute so fast that they go straight onto the boats before anybody looks at them when they're loaded. So they end up with ambulances that are nicely made but too long to make the corners to turn in any European uh, small city. Uh, they get boots with pressed paper heels that last 29 and a half seconds on the Buck on Salisbury Hill. They get wagons that are built from sp spare parts so they're structurally unsound or they're built from green wood so that they warp on the way over. And the Canadians see all this, they're shocked and embarrassed. And the British, when they take a look, are just aghast. But what really seems to push the British over the edge are the water uh, wagons. 
there is no way to clean the water wagons. They're made of rough wood. And furthermore, there's no appliance for filtering the water or for clarifying the water. And the Brits just take one look at this and just go, okay, you guys clearly have no idea what you're doing. Make it all go away. Warehouse it all, we'll supply you. Problem here is, of course, they weren't expecting to have to supply another army. And so they've got nowhere near enough supplies. So there's a delay and more time on Salisbury Field and more guys getting sick. And Sam Hughes back at home is apoplectic. He sees it that the Brits are stalling so that the Canadians won't have their chance at glory. Because remember at this point, they're still thinking the war is gonna be over by Christmas. And so who is he apoplectic at? Sam is not apoplectic at the contractors. He's not apoplectic at the guys who built this junk. He's certainly not taken any responsibility. Oh, no, 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 no. He's mad at the British. And this gets back to the British. So all in all, we are not making a great first impression. But along comes a chance to, to redeem ourselves and a hospital is needed because they really are getting seriously overrun in Europe. Number two, Canadian stationery. That's one of the little guys. They figure that they have found just about enough of supplies to go over, so they step forward and answer the call. Next slide. They landed November 9th, 1914, first Canadians on French soil, and they're assigned to the lovely L'Hôtel du Golf in Le Touquet. And as it happens, if you happen to be short a few knives, forks, spoons, uh, sheets, pillowcases, etc., hotels are a pretty good place to borrow them from, and they did. They were opened on November 27th, got their first patients in, and it's important to note that they're treating patients who are not Canadians. And something that's never mentioned is at the same time as these guys are going over, an additional 15 officers, so doctors, and 11 other ranks are sent off to Boulogne to help take the pressure off the British hospitals there. So we've got Canadian doctors working in British hospitals and Canadian hospitals treating not Canadian uh, soldiers. And this becomes a very long and useful tradition, but we'll get back to this later as well. So gradually the Canadian Medical Corps is deployed into France and later to a variety of other places. They take up the positions and they get to work. So what exactly are these guys all doing? The easiest place to start is to look at what happens to someone who's wounded. Next slide. What happens if I'm wounded? Um, your first line of defense is one of these. There's a little pocket in the front of every Canadian tunic that's specially built to hold one of these. It's a field dressing. It's about the size of a bar of soap. And inside, there's two pads of gauze and with long tails on them, a safety pin, and some of the later ones have a little ampule of iodine in there too. The idea is that you put this on yourself and bind yourself up or your buddy standing next to you does, and you start making your way to the nearest regimental aid post. Next slide. If you can't walk on your own, you hope for a stretcher bearer or you call for one. And there's two types. The fellows on the left here are wearing an SB arm armband and that and six cents will get you a loaf of bread. Doesn't really do a whole lot for you. These guys are brought from up from the regiments and the rather hopeful, optimistic um, ratio of uh, four stretcher bearers per 120 men. Um, they generally don't have any kind of medical training at all. The fellows on the right are from the field ambulance and they're wearing a, an armband with a red cross on it. Now, theoretically, if you're wearing one of those armbands, no one's supposed to shoot at you. In practice, that in six cents will get you a loaf of bread. They, there was no difference made. They got shot just as much as the other guys. Um, these guys have a minimum of six weeks training on a normal basis. And so they've got a little more skill. Now the regimental guys on the left are supposed to go out and dig you out of the mud and these guys, the other guys are supposed to pick you up, but they were so short on the regimental guys that the field ambulance guys were right out there digging you up just right along with them. Next slide, please. Their job is to get you to the regimental aid post. Um, sometimes it's nothing more than a flag in a crater or a dugout as shown on the left. This is where triage begins. And in wartime, triage is exactly backwards from in peacetime. If there's a bad bus accident now, they treat the guy who's got the most serious wounds first and they work their way down to the guy who's got the broken arm. In war, it's completely backwards from that. These guys' job is to get you back out on the field as quickly as possible. 
So they'll take care of the lightly wounded first. Then they'll look at the next batch of guys and go, okay, which one of these guys looks is like he's going to make it? And they're going to spend all their energy there. They're not going to uh, deal with you if you look like you're going to kick over in the next 10 minutes. It's uh, rough, but that's the way it is. They will give you a little tag that's an actually a little envelope, looks like a Paddington bear tag for all the, all the world with your initial diagnosis, your identification and any morphia given. They give you a hot drink, rebandage you if necessary and poop you out the door as fast as you can go. Next slide, please. Now being a stretcher bearer is backbreaking, exhausting, horrible work, and it's also heartbreaking. And it's a really, really good way to get yourself killed. Um, stretcher bearers died at a rate of two to three times that of a, of a regular infantryman. None of these people are armed. It's worth noting that the most decorated soldier of the entire British Army was in World War I was one private, W.H. Coltman, stretcher bearer. Next slide. To ease the burden on the stretcher bearers, on the stretcher bearer, Central Powers prisoners of war were often pressed into service to help carry or otherwise. You can see them going back there with stretcher carts to pick up some wounded. Um, they were usually happy to help out. Um, and the bearers, the British bearers and Canadian bearers actually like to work with them because if you're on a stretcher with three German guys and you, you're probably not going to get shot by the, uh, by the Germans. Next slide. Their job is to get you to the advanced dressing station, which is you know, not that much different from the other station, although it's, it's a little farther back. Um, they're collecting in from several of the regimental aid, aid posts, so there's more people there. Um, you go through a second triage here. You still looking like you're gonna live? Okay, you can go on. They'll do a bandage check, more hot drinks. They'll update your Paddington Bear diary of transfers and send you out the door. Next slide. Now we're getting into transport. Um, typically horse or horse ambulances are motorized vehicle, but you also start to see tramways at this stage and the tramways at your upper left there. It's literally a light gauge railway and it's typically laid just right on top of the earth, bumpy as all heck. Sometimes they've got a little engine like this one does, but a lot of times it's just human powered. Sometimes they're purpose built. This one obviously is not. Um, it's just a matter of a means of getting you out there. Sometimes when the roads are very muddy, it's the fastest means of getting out there. And if you look at the fellows on the right here at the top, you can see their, their diary of transfer is hanging off their buttons. Next slide, please. Now we're onto the main dressing station. Uh, now this is typically under shelter of some kind, um, still well within artillery range. So you may not remain under shelter for all that long. Triage number three, more hot drinks, more bandage checks. Here you get your inoculation against tetanus. If, they, if, if you have a wrist free, they'll write a, a T with an indelible pencil on your wrist. If not, they're happy to write it right across your forehead. Um, they'll add here a field medical card, which is a little more detailed description of what's going on with you. Slip that into your envelope and out the door you, again. you go again. Now this whole bus, batch so far, everything you've gone through so far is handled by the field ambulance. And people think of field ambulance as just stretcher slingers, but on the right hand side here, you'll, you'll see one of their kits. So you can see that they're actually able to handle things that are fairly sophisticated in the field. They're doing, they're doing minor operations, they're, they're closing things, they're trying to make you so you're as stable as possible to be moved. And there are doctors mixed in with the bearers all the way along here. So they don't get a lot of credit for doing a lot of stuff, but they certainly deserve more than they get. All right, out the door one more time, one more horse or motor ambulance or tramway and next slide. Now you're at the casualty clearing station. You're three to five miles behind the lines. And the good news is if you got here, you have a 95% survival rate from this point on. Now the casualty clearing stations are grouped in little clusters so that the first station will take intake for about two hours, then they'll close the door. Then the next station will take all the patients for the next two hours and then they'll close the door. Then a third one will take and so on and so forth. And by the time the third one is ready to close their doors, the first one has had four hours to sort out everything that's come through their door and they're ready to open again. So they just rotate until they're done with the wounded for that day. Um, at the beginning of the war, the goal is to have you in and out of this place in three to five days. As the war gets later on, techniques and priorities change and these, these are enlarged. People are staying longer up to 30 days in places. 
And by the end of the war, these places will hold as many as a thousand beds. This is also the first place you'd see a nurse. Next slide, please. And here we get into the real transport, actual trains, hospital trains. Um, usually hospital trains are motorized ambulances from here. Although again, when the roads are bad, they send in the horse ambulances because horses can go where cars won't. And also apparently if you flip over a horse ambulance, it's a lot easier to, to ride it and put the patients back in good order and continue going. All right, next slide, please. So do you get to go to England or do you stay in France? I mean. What, what you kind of hope you're in England because it's farther from the shooting. But the choice of whether you go to England or to France is really a matter of fragility and expected recover time. Uh, six weeks seems to be in, have been a, the break point. Uh, if you were going to be more than six, you'd go to England. If you're not, you'd stay in France. Also, one thing they would do is if they were planning an offensive, they would try and clear out the French hospitals as much as possible and send everybody to England because they knew they'd need the beds. From here, you'd be evacuated on a hospital ship, onto a train again, and you'd be taken to London's Charing Cross station where you were met by the London ambulance column who would whisk you off to whichever hospital you were supposed to go to. Now, this seems a really heavy, unwieldy, convoluted way to get somebody out of the mud to a hospital. But let me tell you, when it worked, and it did work, it really, really was fast. The Battle of Vimy Ridge opened at 5.30 in the morning, and by 2 o'clock that same afternoon, ambulance trains were rolling into Charing Cross Station in London with wounded from the battle. That's eight and a half hours, and that's assuming that you got wounded right at 5.30 and got picked up right away, which isn't a good assumption. So it worked. So from here, um, if you were very lucky or unlucky, depending on your point of view, you get sent home to Canada. Next slide, please. You would travel on ships run by the Medical Corps or the Canadian Navy working hand in hand. Uh, from there, you'd get onto a hospital train manned or at least managed by the Medical Corps and off to a recuperative hospital in the province that you came from. Now, this whole thing is the chain of evacuation. That's your basic structure of uh, the Medical Corps not the administration, which goes up and up and up through London, but that's your basic structure. Um, are there any questions at this point? Uh, I'll ask one. Well, Chris has a chance to check or, or maybe people have a chance to post. Lots of lots of people saying hello to you, Susan. You proved to be popular. <laughs> way, so. uh, I'm curious, uh, as the war went on, how much did the, the, the procedure or, or process change? I imagine it evolved and, and maybe got streamlined or, or more sophisticated. Um, it didn't, they still stuck with the same procedure, but what they started to do, and we'll talk a bit about, about this a little bit later on, is they started to push more and more of the functions closer and closer to the front. So you have casualty clearing stations doing more um, convoluted and, and more dangerous operations there instead of just patch them up, do meatball surgery and get them out. And then you start to see things get pushed into the field ambulances that would never have been considered to be done by the field ambulances at the beginning of the war. But the same structure and the same chain is, is maintained because it's working. Hi, Sue. Sorry, um, a little uh, a little glitch on muting there. Um, quick question about uh, getting back to Britain. So once you got off the train at, uh, I think you said it was Charing Cross Station. Yeah. How would they How would they decide which hospital you were going to? Was that somewhat random? Uh, no, it was it was planned. Um, and there and in London. It depended how badly you were wounded, whether you needed to go to a full hospital. If you were not that badly wounded, but we're going to take time, they might send you to a cottage hospital. And also, fairly early in the war, we start to see specialized hospitals crop up. So there is people who deal only with abdomen and chest wounds, and there are people who deal with facial wounds, and there are people who deal with broken legs. Broken legs are a big deal in this time period. You can die of a broken leg very easily. So it's partly by where there's space, partly by what's wrong with you. Thank you. I'm just going to uh, remind the people on YouTube uh, watching live that there is a bit of a delay between uh, what Tom, Sue and I, Susan and I are doing on 
uh, on Zoom compared to what you're seeing on YouTube. So if I don't see your question right away, it's, it's probably because of that delay. Um, and so we'll try to get to it again in um, a second. Um, just time for one quick question before uh, we ask you to get back into it. Um, wondering about uh, all the way back to Salisbury Plain at the beginning of your talk, um, was somebody's asking about an epidemic there uh, early on, <laughs> but the note is aside from uh, the VD rate, of course. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I don't know if you'd call it an epidemic, but there was a, certainly a, a widespread um, general um, congestion, sneezing, coughing, cold, and that sort of a thing. Um, it was it was just your general infectious, um, we would call it convention ick nowadays for those of us who attend convention. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't specifically um, denoted as an epidemic, but when you've got 30,000 people, that's a lot of sick people that you can, that you happen to have. Right, not to mention the conditions as well. Yeah. Yeah, they're not getting any better. <laughs> right, thank you. So um, again, just for the people on YouTube, uh, Susan will pause again in a few minutes. So if you've got more questions, please yeah. keep them rolling in, but uh, we'll, we'll pause again in a second. Thank you. And then if I can also add, uh, if you joined the, the stream late, uh, don't panic. Uh, you can go, it, it is being recorded and you can go back and, and catch what you missed uh, after we wrap up. So um, thanks again for everyone joining us today. All right, Susan, back to you. Hey. All right, so now you have a general sense of the basic structure from the patient's point of view and running across this structure are a series of other services that are managed by the medical core between all the facilities is what in, in business school, we called it a, ma a matrix structure. So you've got some time in this way and some reporting that way. Um, probably the easiest way to see how this all fits together is to meet some people. So imagine if you will, that you are feeling the ick uh, you're ill, you've got a headache, you can't see properly, your stomach hurts, and you're brought into a casualty clearing station. And you hear the doctors murmuring over you, it's going to be infectious jaundice, maybe trench fever. And then somebody says, make the call and find out who he came with. And you notice everybody else is being taken away and getting washed up and given pajamas. And you and all the same guys who rode in your ambulance with you are being shunted off into a corner by yourself. And you're wondering what's going on. Next slide, please. And all of a sudden the door bangs open and in comes this guy. He's waving the syringes on one hand. He's got his tweezers in the other hand. He's got a sample bag on one hip, a collecting box on the other hip. He rushes up to you. He takes your blood and he pulls out his tweezers and he starts going through your hair and he's picking the lice out of your hair and putting them live into his collecting box and away he goes. And you're wondering what on earth is going on. And then he says, who is sitting next to you? Same for that guy. Who else is here from your resident? Same for that guy. And this is Sergeant Peacock. You have just been peacocked, as they used to say. Um, Sergeant Peacock is attached to mobile lab number one, which is a really glorified name for a stripped out cargo truck with scientific equipment in the back. Oh, and they get a car too. Um, Sergeant Peacock is an entomologist and he is out there doing absolute leading edge world-class research in studying the transmission of diseases by lice. And he's doing this out of a truck at three miles from the front in the middle of a war. If somebody told you to go do that, you'd say they were nuts, but here he is, he just does. He shares his finding backs to all the units and he saves lives. Next slide, please. He's also much beloved. Uh, even while he's running around the front picking lice off people, he's very much respected. Um, this cartoon has miraculously survived. It says, Sergeant Peacock goes to bed with 700 lice and spends rather a restless night. I think that's delightful. Um, no surprise, he is soon made Captain Peacock, and he actually goes on to a brilliant career in disease transmission after the war. Now, one thing I haven't told you is that he's not Canadian. He's British. So why am I talking to you about a British guy and as a presentation on the Canadian Medical Corps? Well, Sergeant Peacock is the perfect representation of something almost magical that starts to happen within the Medical Corps, not just the Canadian Corps, but the British, the Australians, to a certain extent, the French, and certainly with the Americans when they arrive. 
It starts with cooperation. At first it's required, very soon they're seeking it out. There's a cross-pollination of ideas and practices and communication of these ideas. Remember, everybody's come from a different background. It's like the biggest medical conference in the world in the worst hotel ever. Um, there's a real thirst for knowledge. Um, there's a certain stomach for exploring unusual ways to get the do job done, independent thinking, adaptation, improvisation, even though that might mean breaking the rules, and it frequently does, or working outside the army structure. And this real resourcefulness just bubbles to the surface, the surface and infects everybody. Let's meet some more people. Next slide, please. Here's another terrific example. It's Major J. Bruce Robinson, and he is Canadian. In 1913, um, he does the very first blood transfusion in Canada using a mechanical apparatus at Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto. And he starts promoting this, this whole new science because this is, this is absolute groundbreaking at the time. And he starts training as many doctors as he can. In 1914, he answers the call to go to war and he takes his own blood transfusion apparatus, which is a cannula. If you've ever had an IV line, that's a little bit that goes in your arm and syringes when he goes. Um, he continues to promote the idea of blood transfusion, and he'll train anyone who will sit still long enough for it. He's a real evangelist about this. So he gets stationed way out at casualty clearing station number two, and he produces three clinical case studies on the use of transfusions under blood battle conditions. He publishes these, and they're circulated not only through all of the front lines, but they're also in scholarly medical journals in England, Canada, Australia and the US. And then he does extended follow-ups with all of his patients, not only the people who gave the blood, but the people who received the blood uh, by the very simple means of giving them self-addressed stamp, uh, stamped envelopes and said, I wanna hear from you in two weeks, in four weeks, in six weeks, and eight weeks, and a year from now, I wanna know how you're doing. Um, so it's, it turns into a, he, he's conducting a world-class study as though he's in a lab. and. He, again, he's three miles from the front, working at a casualty clearing station, regularly getting interrupted by national casualty events. What a guy. And the story goes on from there. The problem with blood is that it coagulates, which is great if you're trying to staunch a wound. If you're trying to give somebody a, a, a transfusion and it's gumming up your syringe, it's not so great. And they tried all sorts of different means of getting that solved, flushing it with saline and so forth. Nothing was working very well. Next slide. Enter Major Edward William Archibald, Canadian. He arrives in France in early 1915, and before he left home, he had been doing pioneering work into the use of sodium citrate as an anticoagulant. Well, wouldn't you know, he gets posted at the next casualty clearing station over from Dr. Blood Transfusion. Information is shared, and by mid-1915, blood transfusions using blood created with sodium citrate are in use right out the, the front line. So this is what we're talking about, Tom, with, with things getting pushed farther and farther to the front. Um, they're out there, the field ambulances are doing it, and they're saving lives because the sooner you can get the blood into somebody, the sooner the shock stops. Um, credit for the use of sodium citrate is usually given to the fellow on the left, American Major Oswald Hope Robertson, but he didn't arrive till 1917, so we really do have to give this one to the Canadians. Apologies to any Americans watching. However, Full marks to Major Oswald Robertson for finding that blood treated with sodium citrate could be stored on ice for up to 26 days. And he created the first blood banks while at the front and evangelized that knowledge throughout all the Allied armies. And he really is known worldwide as the father of the blood bank and deservedly so. Next slide, please. I would be very remiss if I didn't spend a minute or two talking about our nursing sisters. The nursing service had been around as long as the medical corps had. They saw service in the Northwest campaign and in the Boer War, although in very small numbers. Uh, in 1900, the Canadian government does a brilliant and trailblazing thing. It accredited them as lieutenants. And this is unique in the British empire until the Australian New Zealand sisters are given their rank later in the war. It gave them an authority at a time when men did typically not listen to women and certainly didn't recognize them as figures of authority. But if you're an enlisted man and a lieutenant tells you to do something, you do it. Doesn't matter who the lieutenant is. It was brilliant. Matrons were made captain. 
and matron and chief Macdo Margaret MacDonald becomes the first woman in the British Empire to hold the rank of major. Next slide, please. There she is sitting at her desk writing. I would not want to be on her wrong side. Um, 3,000 nurses went over, sorry, 3,000 nurses total, 2,504 went over. Profes they were all professional nurses. They had at least two years training courses at a university or a major hospital and were almost always experienced before they were accepted. Any call put out for nurses received 10 times or more as many applications as there were position. So matron in chief McDonald could pick the creme de la creme and she really, really did. These were some ladies, I'll tell you. And this is why it was such a smack in the face to have these women showing up with telegrams because some fella who thinks he's important at home thinks it's okay to tell Matron Mark McDonald what to do. Um, there were 27 of those women she couldn't get rid of. They kept showing up. They showed up on ships. They paid their own way over and showed up at her office in London. And 27 of them had sponsors that were too politically important and she could not get rid of them. She was not allowed to. Some of those, a few of them turned out to be useful as home sisters, which is really a, um, it's more of an administrative position. There's no actual nursing involved. They uh, manage getting the food in, making sure that things like ripped pillowcases are, are replaced, that sort of thing. But most of them were relatively useless. So she just tucked them away in far away little hospitals where they couldn't do a lot of damage. Um, but the damage was there and the nurses themselves really felt that it was an insult for these women to wear their uniforms. So interference that wasn't needed. Next slide, please. At the beginning of the war, there, were, there was a considerable friction between a the various nursing corps. In particular, the, the British philosophy of nursing was very different from the Canadian and Australian, which were actually quite similar. Um, the friction fairly quickly gave way in face of appreciation of each other's skills and the Canadian and Australian nursing sisters became very much in demand by the British matrons, especially the closer you got to the front. Our nurses were well paid, they were independent, they had a real talent for problem solving, and they were not afraid of hard and dangerous works and they were working in some really terrible conditions. They tended to use their own resources and they used their own money to get things done when the army could or wouldn't. And importantly, they were in 1917, they were the first women in Canada to get the vote. Lots and lots of them were very special. I, there's one I really must mention. Next slide. Nursing Sister Margaret Parks, MD. Yes, you read that correctly, or as she was known, Nursing Sister Dr. Parks. She's from Moncton, New Brunswick, graduated University of Toronto in 1901 as a medical doctor. She wanted to go to, to the war as a doctor. They wouldn't let her, so she promptly turned around and applied as a nurse and was accepted in the first contingent, and she was assigned to our old friends sitting in the Hotel du Golf over in the Touquet, number two Canadian stationery. The Army never officially recognized her as a doctor, but the hospital put her skills to use. She was an experienced anesthetist doing his anesthesia in France as early as March, 1915. They also put her surgical, diagnostic and all of her other skills to work as well. Now, later in the war, a number of other nurses were trained as anesthetists and they were also taught some minor, minor surgical techniques, which I'm sorry to say they were encouraged to use on Germans who needed, the, uh, th who needed to be patched up in a hurry. Um, but they all seemed to survive, so I guess they were doing it right. Um, this was certainly breaking the rules, certainly the rules of society, but it saved a lot of lives. Next slide, please. The dentists. Well, food in this war, if it wasn't better, it was at least softer. Um, and as early as 1914, November, the order was given that no man is to be discharged or turned away from service if by treatment he could be made fit to serve. Each recruit underwent dental exams at the time of his attestation and wouldn't you know it, 70% of them needed dental treatment. So here's another good idea gone bad. There are not enough dentists, not just not enough dentists in the Canadian army, not just not enough dentists in the British Army, there are not enough dentists in the world to deal with this. They simply don't exist. In Canada, there's one dentist for every 3,300 people. In Britain, there's one dentist for every 7,000 people. They're just not out there. Canada does her best. 
and when they went over with the first con first contingents of dentists in July 1915, she sent 30. That's all they had. By 1918, 223 dentist officers were over there. And that was just about everybody they could round up. Next slide, please. Between these 233, they did two and a half million dental procedures. That's, if you work it out, it's a minimum of 11,000 per dentist. Busy, crazy. They didn't get days off. Um, in times of stress though, they stood with their medical colleagues during um, mass casualty events and so forth. And they did everything they could from general dog's body to assisting in surgery. And it's when they're assisting in surgery that something really special starts to happen. They would see these men come in with horrible facial injuries, half their faces shot away. And the doctor would be working when the dentist would be saying, I, I can fix this. I can, I can give this guy back a job. I can make an appliance, appliance so he'll be able to eat uh, for the rest of his life. And it's not long before the dentists are doing reconstruction of jaws and they're even reconstructing eye sockets and so forth. And what we're witnessing is the birth of the entire field of plastic surgery. Dentists driving this, not doctors, dentists. And before long, the International Cooperative Hospital at the Queen's Hospital in, Frog, in Frognall, England opens and it's doing groundbreaking work in plastic surgery. Next slide, please. There is so many, there are so many more branches I really love to talk about. There's just not time. There's unsung heroes like the Padres who did so much more than offered spiritual care. They were real favorites of the regimental medical officers. They uh, would, they were really good organizers. They brought a sense of calm uh, and they were willing to turn their hands to everything. Um, there's the sanitary sections. If they're doing their jobs, you never hear about them. So they did, and you never hear about them. <laughs> there are branches that are pushing the bounds of medical science and technology, like the radiographic services. There's the recuperative hospitals in England and Canada, tiny little hospitals and forestry camps, hospital trains in England and in Canada and in Europe, uh, hospital ships. And there's doctors assigned to every Canadian Navy ship. There's trainings camps. There's the whole supply chain. It's all fascinating. There's two hospitals worth of French Canadians who are attached to a hospital in Paris on loan to the French government. Uh, and there's Canadian medical staff all over the world. All of these little red dots are places that there's a Canadian installation. Now I have played with time a little bit here. We were not in the Mediterranean at the same time as we were over there out in Eastern Russia and Vladivostok, but you get the idea. It's a vast vast organization. There's over 20,000 people. And it's spread over the world, literally from Victoria to Vladivostok. Um, it shouldn't have worked. But it did. And I think the reason is that every single person in this service has the same single tangible goal. Every commanding officer and everyone up the chain in the medical service is a doctor. They've all taken the Hippocratic Oath. At the most fundamental level, everybody from the guy pulling the soldier out of the dirt to the guy who's sitting in the office in London and trying to run this beast has the same reason for being there. They want to save lives. Even if that sometimes requires adding by any means possible. And they did. All right. Should we take a couple more questions now? Thank you. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna turn to the nursing uh, side of it if it's okay because we we had several questions about that. I think uh, people are maybe suspecting that that's a bit of a passion of yours. Maybe. <laughs> How could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the first one, uh, keep it simple to start with. What was the uh, what was the pay for uh, a Canadian nursing sister as a lieutenant? Uh, pay was four dollars and ten cents a day, which is four times what your average infantryman is is uh, earning. And they actually named got the nickname of being Canadian millionaires because they were paid better than any of the other nurses too. Fantastic. And then um, turning to uh, their training a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, what would uh, Matron McDonald look for when she's choosing the creme de la creme? 
Well, she's looking for somebody ideally who's got experience with travel, uh, ideally with a lot of hospital experience. She herself had nursed uh, during the Panama Canal, so and she'd been in the Boer War herself, so she really had a, a good sense of uh, the personality that was involved. Certainly with her first hundred nurses, she had at least interfaced directly with each one of them. Of course, it's harder when you're getting up to 3,000 and she's in London, but she's, she's trying to communicate by letter and so forth. Um, she's looking for skills, she's looking for a steady personality, she's looking for somebody who's not the least bit flighty and is really serious about this. And if she has somebody who comes from a military family, they have a real sense of what's required. And that's those people are always um, her favorites to have on board. Also society ladies, because a lot of times they had to work um, sort of around the army to get things. Um, the, they would interface directly with the uh, local Red Cross ladies or the Imperial Order of Daughters of the Empire and get supplies directly in from them to supplement what they could get through the army. And having the political connections to be able to do that was really super useful. You're muted, Chris. I keep pushing mute. Uh, I must be clicking it twice because it's unmuting and muting back. So sorry, one more quickly, uh, still the Canadian nursing uh, sisters. How did their training compare to that of the British or say the, the Anzac sisters? Um, and somebody's specifically asking about uh, training in uh, anesthetics. Okay. Um, the anesthetics training actually came during the course of the war. Uh, I can't tell you about the British training in anesthetics uh, because I don't know. That's something I'll have to look up. The, the um, Australians, the Anzacs, and the Canadians both had uh, somewhere between 85 and 100 uh, who were trained to do anesthetics. And that was uh, specifically they set up a training camp, the Canadians, uh, in uh, London, where the nurses were sent out to do this training, and they also were con were sent up to a casualty clearing station afterwards to do follow up and be monitored by uh, an anesthetist. Um, generally speaking, the British nurses took on much more of a supervisory role in the care of patients, uh, but they were also very keenly trained in observation. They would catch stuff that that doctors would miss and that people that were not so in tune with their patients missed would would miss whereas the canadian and the australian sisters were more hands-on they're doing a lot more bandaging and and wrestling these guys around and getting done what needs to get done in that way so they looked at each other very strangely to start off with but then they realized that they had a lot to learn from each other and began to work together Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we do have a couple other questions, but I'm going to ask that we can save those for the end. Um, uh, and then we can um, we can join any other questions that we get in the last section. So thank you. OK. All right. So shall we carry on? All right. So things are actually going pretty well, despite the fact that this is a beast to manage. And people are changing, exchanging information, they're, they're uh, making advances, they're finding out about things, they're developing whole new sciences. And the doctors, it's really cool, they start setting up their own lecture series, where they'll all go to casualty clearing station number one, or one representative from each hospital anyway, we go to casualty clearing station number one to hear about sanitation one week, and then somebody over at number three has got something that they found about fixing broken legs, and they go there the two weeks later, and it, it was really quite a cool system that they, for exchanging information. Completely informal, not sanctioned by the army, but they did it anyway. And then there's always that guy, somebody who has to throw a wrench in this works. And I bet you can guess who it was. Next slide, please. If you said Colonel the Honorable Sam Hughes, Minister of Militia and Defense, you'd be right. Oh no. And this time you'd be really right to say, oh no, because the bloom is serious off, seriously off Hughes' rose by this time. The Ross rifle had been laid 
at his feet. Now, for those not uh, familiar with the Ross rifle, it was a Canadian rifle that he insisted Canadian people, Canadian soldiers carry into battle. It's a terrific sniper rifle, but if you fire it repeatedly, as one is wont to do in the middle of a war, it tends to heat up and jam. And it was probably responsible for thousands of Canadian deaths. And that was being laid at his feet. He had promised the British fit, well-trained men. And at this point in time, 56% of those going over were not fit to go into the field. Nobody's forgotten about Salisbury Plain. They're blaming him, he blames everybody else. And members of His Majesty's loyal opposition in parliament and the press are starting to dig. And financial irregularities are mounting up and they're adding up and up and up. And if you translate them into Canadian dollar or into today's dollars rather, they're approaching half a billion dollars. That's billion with a B. It's too much to be ignored. So here he is. He's lost or is losing confidence of his colleagues, the Canadian army, the British army never had confidence in him. The men in the field have lost confidence in him. And critically for him, he's starting to lose the confidence of the Canadian public. The thing you have to remember about Mr. Hughes is, even though he wears an army uniform, and he's allowed to because he was in the army for a number of years, he's not part of the army. He's a politician. And there's an election coming up into, in uh, 1917. So we'll never really know what Hughes was thinking. He probably doesn't ever admit it to himself. But we can make some educated guesses. So bear with me, I'm going to speculate a little bit here. There's, there's big stuff coming. Next slide. Hughes sees that the Canadian Army has a lot of support. He figures if he's head of the Army, some of that will rub off on him. He's going to get out there, do great things. Nobody's going to remember about that half a billion dollars. But there's an obstacle. It's a big one. The British and Canadian armies are entwined, just the way the medical services are all entwined with each other. And Hughes firmly believes that he must separate the Canadian army from the British if he's going to gain control of the army and if he's really going to get the credit. And he chooses as his, battle, as his battleground the medical corps. He sees us as the thin edge of the wedge. So Hughes sparks off what he thinks is going to be a really sly piece of political maneuvering, but really it's better described as a three ring circus. And it wreaks absolute havoc in the upper echelons of the medical corps for a number of months. Now, I am just going to scratch the surface here. I could, this, this would take about two or three hours to explain thoroughly, so bear with me. <sighs> Hughes invents a position called Special Inspector General, and he puts an inexperienced person into that position and has him write a, a report on the whole medical corps. That report is approved by a board that contains no doctors and only one soldier, and the soldier refuses to vote on it. But, oh, they're not actually voting on that report. They're voting on a summary of that report and a summary of the rebuttal of that report that are done up by who? Not doctors. Oh, lawyers, because lawyers are the best people to uh, comment on medical things, right? Okay. The fallout from this is that the director of medical services, who's the head of the whole medical corps, is removed, and he's replaced by who? Oh, the guy, the inexperienced guy who wrote the report. And if you think he's inexperienced writing a report, you should see him try and run the, the medical uh, medical corps. There's a huge uproar. There's letter writings, telegrams are flying in all directions. Senior civilian advisors are resigning. Um, but it goes on. And what falls out of this is what's called the segregation order. And the long and the short of the segregation order is they say that Canadian wounded should only go to Canadian hospitals and Canadian hospitals should only treat Canadian wounded. And this is exactly what Sam wants to hear because this is the thin edge of the wedge. You get the medical corps out, the rest of the army is going to follow. But he makes a really bad miscalculation at this point because Parliament won't go along with it and neither will the army. Next slide, please. The problem is it's physically impossible and it's logistically impossible. But Sam is not hearing this. He will not have it. He will not be denied. He keeps pushing. He starts leaking bits of information. Okay, there's no evidence that he was leaking it, but it was him. It had to be him. And those bits of information are cherry picked to alarm the Canadian public. And it all comes to a head when Hughes makes a speech at the Empire Club of Toronto, which is the most powerful public podium in Canada. And he flat out 
insults the entire British Army as a whole. He demeans the entire Canadian Medical Corps, the Royal, the, the Royal Medical Corps, all of the volunteer support services. And he says flat out that Canadians are getting substandard treatments in British hospitals. Think about that. The Flower of Canada is being sent to the wars and the British are not treating the wounded ones well. That is a huge fear to play to plant in the mind of the Canadian public. And that's exactly what he's trying to do because he wants the Canadian public to demand that the medical corps be separated first because the army's got to follow, right? And here's where I'm really speculating, but I, I strongly suspect I'm right. It's not a big mental leap for us to go from our patients are being mistreated in hospitals by the British to Canadian boys are being used as cannon fodder by the British Army. It's not a big leap. I think that's who, where he was going with this. We'll never know because that very afternoon, Prime Minister Borden steps up and demands his resignation as, as minister. He gets it two days later. The damage, of course, however, is done. The speech is reported by cable overnight to London. And the London press is furious in the way that the only, only the London press can ever be furious. And the most, one, most upset fellow is the owner of a newspaper who has donated his house as one of these little hospitals. And he knows right at this precise moment, there are 35 patients in there, most of whom are Canadian, and they're being treated rather well, thank you very much. Lady Drummond, Lord Beaverbrook, they're all called on the carpet and asked to explain they've got nothing to say. So the Canadian government, government asks quickly and they call a committee, but it's actually a good committee. It's a group of doctors, soldiers, and doctors who are soldiers. And they very, very quickly produce a report that completely vindicates the Canadian Medical Corps, the Royal Medical Corps, all of the volunteer services, and they're even kind to the unqualified fellow who wrote the first report. They explain that he wasn't given all the information, which is true. He was given wrong information, also true. And he's just inexperienced, really, really true. So what are this guy? He's still sitting in the director's office. He's actually been trying to resign for the last week, but it's got, or last three weeks, but it's gotten so bad, nobody will even answer his telegrams. Eventually he is relieved. The old director comes back. Unfortunately, the situation for him, he just feels it's untenable. So six weeks later, he transfers out again. The guy from below him steps up. Peace reigns. Hughes is gone. The army is finally being run by the army. Somebody who knows what the heck they're doing is running the medical corps again. And three and a half months of chaos comes to an end. And none of it ever had to happen. Next slide. Meanwhile, in France and Belgium, there's a war going on. And where are we in the middle? Of, where are we at this time? It's, oh, it's just, just the middle of the Somme. It's not anywhere where you actually need to have your medical services running efficiently or anything. Um, so what was happening in the front line all this time? Well, while the top levels are wrangling away, the second and level, third levels of administration in Canada are undertaking a massive damage control project. They are doing their damnedest to keep this from affecting France and, and uh, Belgium in any way or possible. On a number of occasions, they unofficially but flat out told the commanding officers, just keep doing what you're doing, just, just, just go, just make it work. Of course, everybody in France knows what's going on because it's in all the papers. Um, the Medical Corps administration realizes, though, how valuable this cooperation and working with the other nations is, and they do everything in their power to preserve it. They're doctors, and they get it. So here they are in London, saving lives by sitting behind a desk. Bless them. Next slide, please. Development continues. The inventiveness continues. This picture on the top left here is one of my favorites. That's on the sum. And the field ambulances couldn't get through because their wheels kept sinking. So they unhitched the horses, the horses hitched them up to sledges and brought the wounded out that way. Um, one of the things that starts to happen at this point in time is the recognition, the importance of treating, thing, treating a wound as soon as it happens, as close to the time that it happens. So they push everything forward. And this is what we we're talking a bit uh, about before. Um, 
they push more and more complex surgeries to the, the casualty clearing stations. And one of the things they do to help with this is they develop surgical teams. So it's a group of four or five people who always work together. And you know what it's like when you work with someone for a long time, you get, everybody gets a rhythm, you start to anticipate each other, it works really well. So if some place was being overloaded, they'd drop in a surgical team. And then they got really smart. And if there was an offensive coming, they would drop in the surgical teams ahead of time. And then they went one farther and assigned a truck and a marquee and two operating tables and battery powered lights and a battery powdered sterilizer and so on for so forth. Piled that all in the truck with the surgical team. So it's basically have operating room, we'll travel. And they didn't set up independently. They would set up with another unit that was out there, but they weren't taking from that unit's supplies or their room. And basically they just hooked on and away they went. Brilliant thing to do. Um, at the same time, a decision is made that all students of dentistry and medicine who had completed one year of their studies, at least at the time that they enlisted, would be sent back to Canada to finish their studies. Now, why would they pull these men out? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, all of these men, they're not doctors, they're not dentists yet. So they've been serving at the sergeant level or below. So they're, they're orderlies, basically, or dental assistants. And at home, there's a problem because nobody's coming out of medical school or dentist school um, because everybody's overseas and so are, so are most of the profs. So they're looking and seeing there's nobody to help fill the ranks here. There's nobody to help expand our ranks. So they make a deal with these guys and they send them home, they pay for their education, they do an, a, um, a, a fast track for all of their courses. And they say, if you go home and come back, you can come back as an officer, we'll put you into the line right away. Cause heaven knows we need doctors and we really, really need dentists. And 230 of them did. Brilliant, short-term pain, long-term gain. Works for me. Next slide, please. I wouldn't be much of a Canadian if I didn't at least mention Vimy Ridge. Um, from the medical court viewpoint, it was actually really well organized. The battle was April 9th, but the field ambulances began to move into place by February 10th. The battle began at 5.30 in the morning and by nightfall, and remember this is April, so nightfall is still pretty early, the field was cleared of all wounded, including all prisoners of war. And at the, by the same time, only a few hundred patients were still at the advanced dressing station, so two steps back. They used tramways, horse ambulances, every car and vehicle in the entire corps and a few that didn't belong to them were pressed into service. And they had small convoys of eight to 10 cars from farther back running to and from the front for 20 hours solid. In the first 22 hours, they treated 5,976 patients at the Canadian field ambulances and evacuated them. And between April 9th and 11th, they treated 7,350 allied casualties in three days plus 706 um, prisoners of war. And of those, more than half were stretcher cases. And that's, that's really unusual. It's usually about a third. So they're dealing with really serious injuries here. And let's not forget, this is the battle where 5.30 in the morning it starts and 2 p.m. they're arriving in London. Just spectacular. Next slide, please. As the war goes on, Spring 1918, things are really not going well for anyone. On the Allied side, there's not enough men, even with conscription. In April 1918, all Canadian Army units are looked at for fit men, or even fit enough men, uh, who are doing other jobs who should be holding a rifle. And they took 2,000 men from the Medical Corps. Basically, no fit other ranks man was left other than in the field ambulance units. And these were replaced with men who were in the second tier of fitness. So they're 50 or older, had been on base redu or reduced duty if they had a physical or a dental defect, men who'd been wounded and recovered but were not fit enough to go back into the line. And they all started off completely untrained. Next slide. Now, and we also got a bunch of these guys. These, we got a couple hundred uh, underage soldiers that were sent out to medical units to be the strong backs of nothing else. And this is exactly what you want in the middle of a war is 2000 and some untrained people. Um, and of course the central powers at this point are also feeling rather desperate and they're launching the spring offensive, which is the last ditch effort to gain some land and possibly end if not win the war. And all of a sudden the allies find themselves in retreat. Next slide, please. 
and things go into overdrive because you have to get the patients out. You can't leave them there. All sorts of crazy things happen. The spirit of cooperation and creative problem solving and disregard for rules and regulation, that all just goes completely off the charts. Ambulances driven by members of volunteer organizations shall not go to the front. They're supposed to work entirely way behind the lines. Well, I'll tell that to the group of young ladies from the St. John Ambulance and Red Cross who, uh, completely contrary to given orders, got in their ambulances and drove up to the front and collected everybody they could and brought them back. They got back, they got scolded, they were ordered not to do it again, and they just went and did it right over again. So, lasso. Um, they didn't have enough hospital train cars, so they bodged some up like the guys on the left, and then they didn't have time to bodge any up, so they just piled everybody into box cars and sent them on their way. They staffed them with whoever was handy. These Red Cross guys aren't supposed to be on these hospital trains, but they are. Um, my favorite story is of a medical officer and a nursing sister who were uh, evacuating with their unit. They got separated from their unit and they came upon a group of wounded um, that were waiting to be evacuated, but nobody would picked them up yet. And so they pull over the car, they find it, they find a chicken coop. They set up a micro hospital in this chicken coop and start treating the wounded. And it takes two days for the last of the wounded to be picked up. They show up two days later, everybody thinks they've been killed or captured or whatever. But what a great story. And those are some of the success stories. And of course, there are tragic stories, just horribly tragic stories as well. And as 1918 goes on, it gets infinitely more tragic for the medical corps. Next slide. The night of May 19th to 20th, 1918, number one Canadian General Hospital at Etap is bombed and the staff are machine gunned as they're trying to rescue the wounded. Now this is unprecedented for a medical facility. It's 45 miles from the front. Now granted, it is tightly packed in with other units, some of which are military and a training ground, and it is near a railhead, but it's still, it's marked with giant red crosses. It would have been obvious, especially once the first bomb set everything on fire and illuminated everything. So killed in this incident was, was one officer, three nursing sisters, 51 other ranks and eight patients. And then it happens again. Next slide. 10 days later, uh, over at Doulon, the number three Canadian station her, uh, ho stationary hospital is set up in the Citadel, that's the city hall. Once again, marked with a red cross. And this time, it's way off by itself. It's not even directly on a rail line, and it's a good distance from the front line. The first bomb to hit was a perfect bomb hit. It went right through all three floors of the building. The top floor was the sergeant's sleeping quarters. The next floor was the officer's ward with patients and the nursing sister on duty. And the third floor was an operating room where an operation had just finished. And every person on all three floors was killed instantly, losing two officers, one of whom was actually an American who was attached to the hospital, three nursing sisters, 16 other ranks and 11 patients. And then they came back and did repeated runs and bombed all around. They missed everything else. The Red Crosses were illuminated by flames. There's just no explanation for it. But bless them, this stationary hospital had its operation room running again, operating room running again four days later. Amazing. And then came the worst, the nightmare. Next slide. On the 27th of June, the Landerberg Castle, which was Canada's largest hospital ship, is sunk by German submarine number 68. They're 116 miles off the coast of Ireland and heading back to England. So thank heavens, no patients on board. Uh, the submarine tor torpedoed it. Several lifeboats, including one that had 14 nursing sisters were lost in the vortex of the ship sinking. Then uh, the, the lifeboats that survived were rammed by the submarine and they machine gunned the survivors. One lifeboat escaped, 24 survivors of which were from the, of which six were from the medical corps. And they were picked up relatively quickly by the Royal Navy who searched for survivors, but found no others. And killed in that incident were five officers, including a padre, 14 nursing sisters, 72 other ranks, and 143 people from the Royal Navy. There's no question they knew it was a hospital ship. I mean, look at it. It's, blue, it's, it's white, it's got a green stripe, it's got red crosses, and at night it's lit up like a Christmas tree with green and white lights all over the place. Next slide, please. 
and your action is immediate and violent and it's widespread. There is absolute outrage, not only in Canada, but in all the allied countries and all of the neutral countries are chiming in too and saying this is outrageous. Sir Andrew McPhail, who's the official historian of the medical corps, sees this as a turning point moment in the war. And the fate of the German Empire from that day was fixed. It helped on the Victoria the volunteering front and of course the Victory Bonds Drive. And it revi revives the flagging morale at home and also in the trenches. And the tide did turn. And the last hundred days is an entire presentation in itself and, and we just don't have time. And in the end, next slide. It did come to an end, a definite end, if not a happy end, and the war is over and the men start to go home. But for the medical corps, the work is not done. Next slide. On November 12th, we still have all the same patients we had yesterday. Some of the casualty clearing stations are moved forward or even over the borders into Germany. More and more civilians start turning up things they've been ignoring for years, need, need treatment now. And then the medical corps personnel start to be sent home. The, the boys, the underage soldiers, they're out of there. It, some of them on November 12th, uh, which is a pity because most of them turned out to be pretty good. Others are sent home due to family situations and other needs. And their only replacements that are available are in the form of men from fighting units who don't want to be sent home yet. And about half of them work out and about half of them have to be transferred right back out again. So gradually, they're working on moving the patients from France to England. They've got thousands of men still in recuperative hospitals and convalescent camps, and each individual case has to be individually managed. And then, of course, there's the Spanish flu happening. So they are dealing with thousands more sick people as well as the wounded people. So as always, it seems, even in reenacting, <laughs> the medical corps is first in and last out with the last few individual stragglers coming home as late as 1921. Next slide. So in the end, how did they do? 21,453 people wore the medical corps badge. 1,325 did not come home, of whom 34, or sorry, 39 were nursing sisters. They were highly decorated and three Victoria Crosses. They were there at the beginning and they were there at every crux point and at the end, and even after the end, they were still there. They met everything thrown at them with strength and resourcefulness. They showed themselves to be driven not only to act, but to, to learn and to adapt and then to share their knowledge with anybody who'd st sit still long enough. And they even tried to push the knowledge with people who took some convincing. They displayed a constant inventiveness and problem solving. They were good communicators. They were compassionate caregivers. They were insightful. They were skilled at healing. And they faced danger and they stared death in the face and they fought and they won. And they're a credit to the profession, a credit to Canada, and we will remember them. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Sue. Um, if okay. I, if, uh, if you're okay, uh, a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll start with a couple. I'm sure a few more will roll in as we go. And we'll, um, to our viewers, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit. Um, to the surgery you talked about, I think it was in the in the middle section. Um, you used the term meatball surgery. Uh, now, somebody pointed out that penicillin wasn't um, invented or uh, discovered, depending on your yeah. point of view, until the 1920s. So, I, I guess how how rudimentary was was that surgery? Um, I mean. Maybe maybe you could put it in perspective for some of us 1812ers who sort of see amputation as as the standard uh, the standard surgery medical army surgery. Sure. Uh, how yeah. rudimentary was it? It wasn't rudimentary at all, actually. They they were pretty advanced at what they could do. Um, yes, there were a lot of amputations, and most of that was because of gas gangrene. Uh, now, gas gangrene has nothing to do with the gas used in warfare. It's actually a gangrene that starts because um, of bacteria that gets into the wound. Um, I could go into a long speech on that, but that's not the question you asked. Um, they were doing things like they were, they'd learned to reattach arteries. They couldn't graft them yet, but if they could stretch the artery yet, together, they could actually attach it to each other. Um, they had developed uh, what's called Carol Dakin's solution, which is a method of, of 
uh, sluicing the wound with a, it's almost like a bleach like solution to try and clear out any infection that was there and clear it. They didn't have any kind of antibiotics at all. So they're really up against the wall, but that didn't stop them from pushing the edge. I mean, they were taking bits and pieces of shrapnel out of people trying to patch up their legs. Amputation was a last resort. There were a lot of them and there was a lot of infection, but they, they still were quite sophisticated with that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, really interesting question going back to Vimy Ridge. Now, we have this, um, as Canadians, we have this vision of, of Vimy Ridge as being rehearsed to the, the kind of the nth degree, right? And that was a huge, important factor. Did the Army Medical Corps re, uh, rehearse things before that? Uh, like, would they rehearse the evacuation routes and that sort of thing before the, uh, before yeah. the battle? Yeah, exactly. And that's why they sent the field ambulances, started sending them in, in on February on February 10th. There were 13 field ambulances in total. 12 of them were at Vimy Ridge. And what they would do is they would get in there, they'd see how the trenches laid, they'd lay out their plans for evacuation, they'd spy out landmarks. Um, and some of them even made up specific maps for evacuating the the uh, the, the wounded, it was a whole plan. Uh, and they, as I said, they considered it very well organized start to finish. Thank you. Um, this one's a, a little bit uh, aside. Um, do you know how many Canadian women uh, joined the British Red Cross? Um, somebody point, uh, was bringing up a particular story, I think somebody from Vancouver, though I've, I've lost the, the story and the scrolling, uh, but was that fairly common? Yes, it was, because it was really hard to get into the Canadian Medical Corps. Uh, and, and actually, nurses who couldn't get into the Canadian Medical Corps on a semi-regular basis would join the British Medical Corps or the French Medical Corps, and then they would reapply to the Canadian Medical Corps when a thing came up, when a space came up, and they actually had a better chance of getting in because they'd already been in the war and they had the experience that uh, Major McDonald was looking for. So yeah, it was very common. Um, and not only with the medical corps, but also with the volunteer aid detachments and the Red Cross hospitals, uh, they were all over the place in London and they needed staff. So if you were a qualified nurse, you could pretty well write your own ticket uh, somewhere else if you couldn't get into the medical corps. Thank you. And one more, I think um, this is a, a little outside what you were talking about, but I wondered if you could uh, comment on the Spanish flu a little bit and um how how successful were um those those in the army medical corps at dealing with the spanish flu i mean obviously it was it was a global <laughs> pandemic yes. but did they have any success at all um they had learned some things in the war that came in handy um, they learned that infectious diseases are best treated in tents rather than in buildings, just the, the ventilation was better. They had learned about what they had, what they called the sunshine cure, which was they put people, they, regardless of what kind of a facility they were in, they would put them outside and get them fresh air and sunshine. And that seemed to work against the flu as well as everything else, like vitamin D, I guess. I'm not, I'm not a medical person, so I can't explain the mechanics of it. But those were, those were a couple of the things that they used. Um, it was devastating. A lot of people died from it. Um, they, they didn't have any particularly higher rate of survival than other places, but they did put into use some of the things that they had learned with other infectious diseases. Great, thank you. And. Um... By way of wrapping up, I wonder if you have any recommendations for people that want to learn more about um, specifically the Canadian Army Medical Corps or maybe uh, maybe Army Medicine in general. Sure. Um, my favorite book that gives you sort of an overview of everything is called Wounded, and it's written by a lady by the name of Emily Mayhew. It, it's told in a series of, of little uh, vignettes, and it really puts you into the position of the people who are there. Um, for the Canadian Army Medical Corps, there's a uh, wonderful book called Lights Out, and I've, the author's name is Kate and her last name is Gone. I'm sorry, but it's Lights Out, and it's, di it's the diaries of a nurse who's sent to Lemnos and Salonika, which is the, the worst place in the world to be, uh, worst conditions, and what they went through there. There's a lot of that. Um, information is, is absolutely valuable in understanding the Canadian Nursing Corps and the Canadian Medical Corps as a whole.
we seem to have lost Chris. <laughs> She's going to buy the books. <laughs> yep. So, uh, and then maybe Susan, I'll, I'll get those uh, names of the books and then put sure. it in, in the comment associated with this video so people can come back and, and look at that. So uh, I say let's wrap up with this. Susan, thank you so much. Uh, excellent presentation. Lots of great, great feedback in, in the chat. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, really appreciate you supporting us and, and being on this journey with us. This has been a lot of fun to, to run and uh, looking forward to four more great talks before we wrap up the first half of the year. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank really you. appreciate your support. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.